So the first thing we should probably talk about is we should go into this. So we are in 05 port. And so in order to interact between core IBC and the application level, core IBC defines an interface. And it says, this is the IBC module interface. This is the interface that any IBC application that wants to interact with core IBC needs to implement fully. And most of these are callbacks. So you can think of this as core IBC does all this core logic, packet processing, proof processing, it makes these guarantees. And then it does callbacks to the application level where the app application level can do some sort of application state changes and either reject things or write them as successful after it does it. And then core IBC will continue processing once it receives back um, the response from those callbacks. So you'll see that most of these callbacks will like return an error as the main uh, consideration. So we have all the channel callbacks. So for open init, open try, open act, and open confirm, we pass in all the relevant information we can. And then we just ask back for the application to tell us whether the callback was successful or a failure. We also have callbacks for Chan close init and Chan close confirm. What we'll see later is in ICS 20, we just returned an error here on Chan close init. So um, the only way that the channel could be closed if for some reason the counterparty was attacked. So I guess I, I've spoken correctly before, a channel could probably be closed in the case of a light client attack. So the light client tricks um, the other chain into thinking that it had closed its channel, which then would allow on chan close confirm um, to be processed. You could in our implementation probably change close chan close confirm to also error. And in that case, the, the channel would not be able to be closed. Cool. And then we also have callbacks for on receive packet. And you'll notice a very interesting thing here. We don't return an error. Um, we return an acknowledgement. And in our implementation, this acknowledgement must indicate whether the acknowledgement was successful or a failure. Um, the main reason for this is uh, a little bit of a trickiness within the SDK. We want to make sure that the um, we don't have like unpersisted or like persisted. We don't want the application logic to fail, and then there to be state changes which don't get reverted. And so, in the SDK, when you return an error, it reverts all of the state changes. But it's possible that the acknowledgement could fail. So we could try to receive a packet. We could realize, oh, we can't actually receive this packet. And we might have like a couple state changes that already occurred when we were processing this. Um, so instead of having a very tricky interface, we just wanted something very simple, which is we're just going to assume you're not going to have like uh, any weird things like unmarshalling errors. And if you do, you're just going to panic in this callback. And then that will get your state changes reverted. But if for some reason you run into an error, this probably needs to be reported in the acknowledgement because this is probably an error with receiving the packet. It's not with like an error within your code is like completely unexpected. Um, so here we return the either successful or failed acknowledgement. And then the other on acknowledgement and on timeout, they go ahead and return the regular error. And then this is a newly added function here, which is negotiate app version. Um, this might have been discussed on the channel walkthrough, but it has to do with returning the correct channel version on the chan open try step. Um, but not super relevant today for ICS 20, since ICS 20 only has a single version as of right now. Um, so that is the interface with core IBC. So let's actually, before we dive into the code that interacts with that, let's look at the, the types we'll be working with. Um, so the first thing to note here in IBC Go is that we have two versioned um, proto definitions. And the reason for this is because we recently made a change in the version two, which 
changes the fungible token packet data, or at least how we represent it on IBC Go. It doesn't actually change what is encoded in the wire. But when we made this change, because the proto definition was changing, we needed to bump the version. Um, and we couldn't bump the version for our other definitions because the way the SDK is written is um, proto buff innies, when they're packed and, un and unpacked, they reference the proto URL. And so if the proto URL changes because the version changed, then those are two completely different types. So if we tried to bump all of these proto definitions, that would also bump this message transfer, which actually does get packed and unpacked as an any because of the SDK message interface. So if this change, that would cause like relayers and wallets to have to understand which version of message transfer to send to which chain based on their version. That's obviously a headache. And so we decided to leave any of the proto definitions that remained unchanged in version one and only bump the proto definitions for the ones that did change. So that's why we have this version one and version two. The important detail for ICS-20 is actually this fungible token packet data, because this is the data, the application data that we're sending in our IBC packet. And it contains a very small set of information. It contains our sender, our receiver, the amount of the token we want to send, and the denomination of the token. And these are all strings. What recently changed was in our proto definition previously, this was a UN64. Um, but the way protobuf JSON marshalling works, it actually encodes the UN64 as a string. So we we're able to change this amount to be a string without changing the wire format. And this allows for larger amounts such as UN256 to now be sent across chains which support this. Um, which support greater than UN64. The denomination here could be just U microatoms, just regular atoms, but it could also be an IBC denomination. Um, but it, what it will not be is what you may have seen of this like IBC slash hash, then like this long hash. Um, what it will be is like a path. So transfer channel 40 and atoms. And the reason that is, is because if chain receives an IBC slash hash, it's not gonna have any idea what this token means. We need to send the full history of this token along with it. And so that this token can then be redeemed if it goes back in the reverse direction. Cool. Um, let's see. Those I will not touch on. Um, in the SDK, it's good to know that if you're sending, a, if you want to interact with the chain, you need to send an SDK message. So we have this message transfer here, um, which allows like a user construct this message and send it to the chain it wants to. And this message would include information like what source and port, what port and channel it would like to send across, what token it would like to send, the sender, the receiver, and then some timeout information for the packet we're going to be sending as well. Oh, uh, so that, uh, yep. Question. So, so you said that the DNAM on the packet uh, contains the full, yeah, the string with the 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 the, the, the port and channel, right? right. Uh, so, so then the, the hash is only used uh, um, uh, on the on the on the um, on the let's say the destination chain to to show the uh, the dynam, but when it's already received, but it doesn't. So so is the hash only used basically for for displaying the balances of, of the user? So. The, the context behind the hash here is, so ICS-20 doesn't specify this hash stuff at all. It's completely left out of the specification. And so the, what, you, what I showed you in the walkthrough, right, is all the path information. We need the full path information. Otherwise, we can't go backwards. So we always need to be transferring all of this information. But the problem we ran into when implementing this is that we wanted, in IBC Go, we wanted to use just the regular SDK's coin implementation because it's been around, it's audited, it's re uh, reliable. And so the problem is that the SDK does denomination validation. And you know the SDK might impose certain characters from not being included in the, in the denomination. 
it might impose certain lengths. And so instead of trying to work around this, the better idea was when we receive this token with this path, instead of using the full path as the denomination, let's create some sort of internal representation of this path and store a mapping from this internal representation to the full path or the other way around. And that way we can go ahead and we can accept tokens of any sort of denomination. So long as it's a string, it's fine. And then we can just go ahead and hash this. And now we can uh, treat this as just a generic token that we minted and we don't have to care about doing validation on the full path itself. So really that hash stuff was just meant to be like an internal representation that was never really even meant to interact with clients. It's a little bit been adopted um, by the ecosystem, I think. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if that's good or bad, whether this should be a recommendation in the ICS 20 spec or not, but it's been a useful abstraction within our implementation. So we don't get caught up in sort of this path, which could be of infinite length because you could always just be doing forward transfers. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, yeah, yeah. Cool. And, and, and maybe, so, so, so if you send a token chain to, from chain A to chain B to chain C, uh, then when, when you want to send it back, um, the, the relayer, uh, the, the, where does the relayer get from the the, 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 the whole path of the Dina uh, from? So, so that he knows the history of, of the, of the, yeah, of the so, that it went through. Uh, so when we transfer from chain A to chain B, we need to actually specify the token name. Um, does that make sense? We, tr we transfer from chain B to chain C. We also need to specify the, the full path. So we need to specify the destination port and channel that was appended in the first hop and in the first transfer. And so there we're sending along the information of transfer channel 40 atoms. And chain C receives it and it appends that information. And then what the relayer may be interacting with is this internal representation. So it might have this IBC and then hash, but what it can do is it can go ahead and do a query, which is like, okay, I wanna send the, I wanna return this IBC uh, I want to return this IBC token back to its original chain. So it goes ahead and it queries chain C for the full path information. And then it uses that when sending the packet. I'm not sure how the uh, IBC Go client code exposes this. I'm not sure if it accepts the IBC hash or if it accepts the full path. Um, but the idea is when chain C transfers back to chain B, it will be specifying a token with two appended prefixes. Mm -hmm. So like transfer channel 100, transfer channel 40, atoms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the full path is stored in a state somehow? Yes. Somewhere, okay. Every time we receive a token in IBC Go, before we go ahead and mint them, we check to see if we've received this path before. If not, then we store it so that we can reference it later. Mm -hmm.